No, no, you've got to put great thought, great effort, great evidence together if you want to push back and break my thinking. But the point is, we are allowed to do that. With great thinking and great evidence, we are allowed to push back against anything. And this type of intellectual freedom might be exactly what some of our disengaged students are yearning for. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's From Theory to Practice, where I take a look at the research so you don't have to. Now the article I've selected this week is called Myth and Reality in the Battle Between the Pygmies and the Cranes by Ovidaya and Muxnik. So a couple months ago I heard about this idea and it has been stuck with me ever since. I'm becoming somewhat obsessed and I wanted to share this idea with you because I think it is incredibly cool. Now to understand this paper, we have to come to terms with the concept of the geronomachy. Now this is a Latin phrase that loosely translated means war of the cranes. So yes, cranes as in big old birds. Now who were these cranes fighting? Well, for the answer to that, all we have to do is turn to Homer, where in the Iliad he says, The Trojans came on with clamor, like the clamor of cranes bringing slaughter and death to the pygmy men. Yes, the Geronomachy describes a thousand year war between cranes and pygmies. Genetically speaking, the pygmies are among the world's most unique people because of their height. On average, pygmies are 35% shorter than the standard human being. Now importantly, this isn't only mentioned by Homer. This appears all over Greek and Roman mythology. So for instance, in Aesop's fables, one of the tales he tells is of a group of cranes who land in a farmer's field, and as the farmer tries to shoo them away, the cranes say to themselves, let us be off, off to the land of the pygmies. Herodotus, Aristotle, Pliny the Elder, and it's not just philosophers. The Geronomachy has been depicted on Etruscan tombs, on Greek and Roman vases. This battle appears everywhere, and apparently the battle was so fierce that Homer compares it to the ferocity and the duration of the Trojans versus the Greeks. For the last couple hundred years, scholars have had to combat this concept. What in the heck are all these Greeks and Romans talking about? And for hundreds of years, we've described this as a myth as a fable, as a legend, something pulled out of the imagination that brought joy to ancient Greeks and Romans. In fact, the first time I heard about it, it was described as an ancient comic poem. And this might have been where the whole story landed. We have this interesting story meant to help people orient themselves to the world. But that isn't where it ended. Turns out the same Geronomachy is mentioned in ancient Chinese literature, ancient Japanese literature, African myths, North American myths. This myth appears to be everywhere. So where is all of this coming from? Well, that's what the authors of this paper try and figure out. They said, okay, for centuries we've been talking about this thing as though it is a myth. What if it's not? What if this is real? What if at a distant time in our past, there really was a race of very small people who yearly had to fight with cranes and somehow ultimately they lost this battle? And it turns out that's what the evidence strongly suggests, that the Geronomachy actually happened in our past and all of these writers, all of these cultures were all talking about a very real event. We now track this event to the migratory patterns of a bunch of cranes we know from Scythia. So every winter when it gets too cold, these birds fly from Scythia down to the region of Egypt, Ethiopia, where we now have archeological evidence that a race of pygmies existed. Human beings that stood about three to three and a half feet tall as adults and about one foot tall as children. Unless you think this is crazy, Turns out, we think modern pygmies are ancestors of these ancient Ethiopian Egyptian pygmies. Now what would happen? So far as we can piece together, every year the cranes would come down to nest during the summer months. And during that time, we think the pygmies would go out and try and collect the crane eggs for food. Now in response, the cranes would naturally protect their eggs, fight back, and due to their large stature, we assume many pygmies died on these hunting raids. Meanwhile, in 2010, on the Indonesian island of Flores, where we've long had archeological evidence that a small group of pygmies lived there, we unearthed remains of the marabou stork. This stork stood about six feet tall, was a meat eater, and we are now hypothesizing would feed on the children of these hobbit-like pygmies. This is where we think largely the Chinese and the Japanese got their ancient stories from. But regardless, in the long run, the Geronomachy appears to be true. As the writers of this article simply state, the battle between cranes and pygmies appears to display a real hunting scene and not merely a mythological tale. So that's where we can now bring it back 
and see what this means for us as teachers. I can think of one big take home from this entire story and it's this. Academic humility. Everything we teach today could and likely will be wrong 50 years from now. And to understand that, all you have to do is look in the past and you will be embarrassed by the things we were teaching our students. But at the time, we were teaching them as though there was no question whatsoever as to their validity. 1,500 years ago, everybody knew the Earth was the center of the universe. 500 years ago, everybody knew the Earth was flat. And 15 minutes ago, you knew that people were alone on this planet. Imagine what you'll know tomorrow. As modern teachers, one of the best things we can do is recognize that in 50 years, everyone is going to look at what we're teaching, and there's a good chance they're going to be questioning the validity of that. And that is okay. Once we recognize that facts have a half-life, then we can deal with them slightly different. By all means, we're still going to teach things to our students. That's never going to go away. But now we can approach what we teach with a more nuanced aspect. We're allowed to question the ideas we teach. We're allowed to teach the controversy, where things make sense, where they don't, where we think they might change in the future. And all of that isn't stripping students of a good education. All of that is allowing students to more accurately and truthfully enter into what an education is. At the end of the day, our job as human beings is to stand on the shoulders of the past and change what they've done. Break how they understood the world. That is evolution. That's how human beings move. We look in the past, we see what we did wrong, and we do it better now. But it's one thing to learn something is truth. It's another thing to learn that bit of information with the recognition that you are allowed to question it that you are allowed to change it. Now, there's no easy answers. My kids can't just say anything. And as a teacher, I go, well, that's probably right. Who knows? No, no, you've got to put great thought, great effort, great evidence together if you want to push back and break my thinking. But the point is, we are allowed to do that. With great thinking and great evidence, we are allowed to push back against anything. And this type of intellectual freedom might be exactly what some of our disengaged students are yearning for. Maybe an entire subset of students simply disengages because they don't feel like they have anything to add or they feel like they can't add anything. And here we see that's simply not true. So as teachers, the Geronomachy can teach us academic humility. My teaching really started to elevate once I stopped assuming I was teaching people brain truths and I started telling my students, okay, your job is to prove me wrong. Do not take anything I say as gospel, but use that knowledge and information the way we currently think about the brain to build better stories about the brain and how it works. That freed me up, that freed my students up, and that's what this reminds me of. So thank you all so much for hanging out with me. I hope you got something cool from that. If you like what you heard, if you can give us a thumbs up and subscribe below, it'll make sure more people get a chance to see this video. Otherwise, thanks so much for hanging out and I'll see you guys next time. Bye y'all.